off a series we're doing with folks who have built operators that run on OpenShift, but we're not necessarily going to talk about the operators specifically. We might talk about them a little bit and get you guys um, to tell us what you did and what you learned building them. But today we're going to do something um, kind of special, actually. We're going to, the title is uh, Database Transactions in Kubernetes and OpenShift. But the guests are um, from Cockroach Labs. We have with us Spencer Kimball, the CEO and co-founder, and Jim Walker, who's the VP of Product Marketing at Cockroach. And um, we're going to have an interesting conversation with them because uh, Spencer comes um, out of Google, has a lot of um, the genesis of Cockroach DB is comes out of Google. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about distributed SQL. We're going to talk about um, working with OpenShift to make all that work for you and um, kind of the impact of cloud, 5G, serverless, and all those kind of things. So it's going to be an interesting conversation. And so um, to kick it off, I'm going to let Jim Walker and, and Spencer Kimball introduce themselves and we'll figure out where that noise is coming from. But we'll let you go and um, Introduce yourselves, Jim and Spencer, and we'll have live Q&A at the end. So ask in the chat wherever you are. That is great. And thank you, Diane. Thank you for having us uh, sincerely. This is a bit of a, a little bit of a homecoming for me as well, because I was, uh, I was a member of the CoreOS team as well. And so, you know, CoreOS being part of Red Hat and, and part of OpenShift and this whole shift to Kubernetes and everything else, you know, um, I'll introduce Spencer. I'll let him introduce himself, but I got to say, the very first time I ever met Spencer, actually, I was working for CoreOS. So here we were driving down the Kubernetes route, and, and Spencer and, and, and Alex Polvey, who was with CoreOS at the time, wanted to actually demonstrate a database that would survive the failure of pods and the failure of systems. And uh, you know, we, we, they had this wonderful demo, I think. Um, but when I found this database, I was like, wow, that's that's what's needed. That that is that's right for this this modern architecture. And so. Uh, hi, my name is Jim Walker. I am a VP of Product Marketing here at Cockroach Labs. So, Spencer, do you want to introduce yourself? Has the has the fire engine gone by yet? Yes, I, I believe it has. That's the uh, the risk of conducting this interview uh, on top of a roof in Manhattan. So I will try to mute if it happens <laughs> again. Hopefully, it doesn't. Uh, yeah. So, you know, yeah, I've been in the industry now, wrestling with databases for about thirty years. Uh, it started even when I was at university. I wasn't very interested in databases, but uh, the reality is if you try to build anything, you, you run headfirst into them. And, uh, and I did a dot-com startup and then ended up at Google in 2002, and I was there for 10 years. And I, it was really a front-row seat on the evolution of Google's interest in databases. And one of the first things I worked on was uh, around the uh, AdWords product, and they were using MySQL, and they ended up having to shard it which just means that you have some customers on one MySQL instance, but it gets too big, so then you em employ another MySQL instance and then another and then another as you grow. And by the time I left that project, it was about 32 shards, and eventually uh, went to about 1,000 uh, shards before they replaced it. Then Google built Bigtable, which is super interesting. That's like about, hey, we, we, we don't want SQL, or we do want SQL, it's not really the point. We want scale, and we want elastic scale. And then they built something called Megasource, started to introduce transactions a couple of years later, and then finally Spanner. So I actually worked on some of that distributed infrastructure, a, a product called Colossus, which is a exascale distributed file storage, is kind of the successor to GFS, um, but also worked on applications in between. And so I got this, it's a really nice cycle, right? You work on applications, you decide, well, there's some things that are really missing from what the infrastructure is providing. Then you work on infrastructure and you get to uh, provide those things, and then you go back, back to applications and you realize, that's great, I've got that now, but uh, I need these other things. And so the cycle continues. And when we left Google, and I say we, because I've got two co-founders of Cockroach, and all of us worked at Google uh, for those 10 years together, we, we wanted to build the way Google built. And not everything that Google had internally was available in open source at that point in time. And in fact, open source really felt about 10 years behind. I think the world's caught up to Google um, Quite dramatically, and that's part of what Cockroach is, right? It started as sort of a manifesto. We weren't trying to build a database when we left Google. We were trying to build a private photo sharing application, uh, but it became pretty obvious that what Google had evolved internally was exactly what we needed for our startup. Uh, and then we got acquired by Square, and we realized, wow, Square needs a lot of the same things that uh, we needed at Viewfinder and that Google needed for the 10 years we were at Google. And then you look around, uh, people I knew at Dropbox and at Pinterest and at Yelp, and everyone needed a database like this. So that's where we started the open source project. 
And, uh, you know, the rest is sort of history. It's been five and a half years now at Cockroach. And, uh, you know, we have some of the world's biggest companies and some of the world's smallest companies as our customers. It's uh, very exciting. But uh, the, way, the right way to think about Cockroach is it's a relational, you know, SQL-based database. In fact, it looks like Postgres. But instead of being monolithic in the tradition of systems like SQL Server and DB2 and Oracle, where you're really scaling up uh, an instance that sits in one location, Cockroach is fully distributed you know, from the the, the, the the sort of most basic parts to the, the overall system. It's fully distributed. And what that really does buy you is, you know, what we're going to talk about fundamentally in this interview. But it's been, and then, uh, it's been a long journey. And, uh, you know, I'm... I never was interested in databases when I was at university, but uh, it's what I've basically spent all my time on since. So Spencer, thank you for that. That was like basically the first half of our conversation in a nutshell. I love it, buddy. So the, um, so I, you know, there, there are two things I actually want to actually ask you about too. Um, in university, you also had a pretty popular, I guess it was an open source project or do, aren't you and uh, one of our founders actually started something. I think a lot of people are familiar with what was that? You, you never mentioned yeah. it. I got to pull it out from you. <laughs> yeah, we've had a long association. So Peter and I have been working together now for 27 years. We met in 1993 at Berkeley. Yeah. And uh, we were, you know, coming out of, in 93, it was, everyone had Windows or Mac at home, Mac OS, one of these earlier versions of Mac OS. We had Windows 3.1. I can't remember exactly what it was at that time. And we got to Berkeley and it was, wow, look at these Unix systems. And, you know, by today's standards, they weren't so good, but, you know, we were using these Sun, Solaris, Workstation yep. and things, and we were so impressed at uh, the Unix ecosystem and all of the free software. And what really was missing, though, is photo editing, which we were used to, right. you know, using Photoshop and the like. And there was XV and there was something called XPaint, and they were, you know, pretty, pretty sad uh, compared to what Photoshop was at that point in time. And so we, we kind of decided one night, um, after a couple of beers, I guess, uh, that, you know, hey, this would be a wonderful thing to build uh, as sort of free software. And so that's where the idea of the GIMP came from. And GIMP was, uh, you know, titled as GNU Image Manipulation Program, but it was really inspired by Pulp Fiction, which came out that year. Uh, we just right. uh, thought that character was funny and, uh, <laughs> you know, bring out the GIMP when you've got a difficult photo editing task. So uh, we, yeah. we worked on that for basically our entire undergraduate career is often skipping classes and uh, not doing a great job on some of our projects uh, in lieu of working on this like uh, full time. And then when we left college, the beauty of it is that we stopped working on it in 97 and it still exists and it's going strong, right? right? So it's been, since we stopped working on it, it's been 20, uh, 23 years. That's It's hard to imagine, but 23 years and the open source community has inherited it and has promulgated it and improved it continuously and that's yeah. the beauty of open source and that is the beauty of open source it's exactly right it's it's years and years later and here you are still doing open source as well but um the question that you and i always get uh, no matter where we go what's with the name right so cockroach db i think you kind of described it but like a little bit about the name i think people always ask us that right so how did you come up with the name well as you can tell uh i think peter came up with the name gimp and uh Peter and I happen to have similar senses of humor. And so we like things that are a little bit uh, darker, maybe is the right way to say. Um, just kind of tickles our funny bone. Uh, you know, Cockroach, the name was one that I chose. And it was really because when we were desperately figuring out what kind of database we were going to use in our viewfinder architecture, which was the private photo sharing startup, we kind of hit on the idea after examining things like HBase and Cassandra and MongoDB and you know all of the normal things like MySQL and Postgres. We, we said, you know, we want something that's like Google Spanner, but it should be open source. Right. And you know, if we were going to think about how it's going to work, it's like these individual sort of uh, pods or uh, nodes that are all greedily optimizing, but making sure that the data they have is is replicated elsewhere, sort of greedily managing that. If you give them more space, they colonize it, right? And so this idea, um, you know, just kind of the evocative concept was a bunch of cockroaches. I live in New York City <laughs> and I don't like cockroaches, believe me, I hate them. I mean, I hate them probably more than most people. So it's a little ironic I chose the name, but I never really thought I'd be explaining it to, to big audiences. Um, and here yeah. we are. Well, funny enough, I think uh, love it or hate it, people remember it, that's for sure. It's uh, it's definitely got, you know, it, it definitely has that going for it. So. 
But let's talk about Spanner and Google a little bit and kind of the gen, because that is really the genesis of CockroachDB was, I mean, the Google, you know, the Google Cloud Spanner, that, that white paper that they published, right? And, and some of those sort of things. I mean, you were kind of front lines in terms of like, they, they had Bigtable, you mentioned this in your intro, they had Bigtable, they had a couple other solutions. Why did Google need to build yet another database on top of Borg and everything else at the time? I mean, I, I know you weren't on that team, but you were kind of adjacent to that, right? I mean, I think you were working, were you working at within like the Colossus team at that time, like the, the file system, correct? That's right. That's yeah. not quite a file system. I think of it as a blob storage system, really. I mean, they built some file system stuff on top of it. Yeah, right. you know, Google has a, a had a long and storied history of databases, and I'm sure it's continued in the eight years I've been gone. Um, you know, Google is not afraid to to do pretty involved R and D, and and part of the reason was that they had to, like if they right. wanted to realize their ambitions. And you know, if you think about Google in 2002, scale was a you know an unbelievably pressing concern for them. They had the entire world basically um, starting to do you know, daily, maybe hourly, maybe by the minute, right. uh, you know, actions that involve their systems. And so they needed very large scale databases. And at the beginning, it was really read only databases or write once, read many times. Uh, they had these systems that were, you know, really just read only indexes. And then they started moving to something that could kind of gradually layer in additional changes it's called the RT server. And then they, the, the, the indexing pipeline, you know, was kind of its own database and index and so forth. It was very custom purpose. But then they started branching off into other things like AdWords, for example, right? So they needed something to manage all the creatives and, you know, the places where people come in. And that's, that's where they started using MySQL. Uh, and, but at the same time, they started building other things, uh, like uh, started storing data for every, you know, if you had a cookie and you started searching on Google, they wanted to associate data with that so that they could build better search, right? So that they knew what you're, uh, what you were probably looking for based on past things. And, and so th there was, uh, you know, a huge need for, you know, massive scale data. What's interesting is that uh, original MySQL AdWords project, because it started to scale way beyond what one instance of MySQL could handle, um, and, you know, I got put on that project to help because it started to fall over when it got to like, more than four shards and just too many connections coming in from too many application servers and it kept crashing the databases. So they had this ads war room because every morning we'd be in there and, uh, and Jeff Huber was running it. Uh, he's had quite a career. Uh, and, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd look at the problems that, uh, the, that happened since the, the last day and we'd be like, figuring out how to solve them, how to do the short-term fixes, this is what the medium long-term fixes were. And that, it's, that went on for months because it was such a big problem. And we, we got it somewhat stable. We built lots of interesting things. As I mentioned before, that went to a thousand shards by 2012 oh, wow. or 13. So it went, you know, it was hard enough getting past eight and, you know, getting to 32, they went to a thousand. And if you actually look, add up all the engineering involved in that over that 10 um, year period, uh, it probably is enough to build a couple databases. So that's that's interesting, but this is a pattern that repeats itself. At Facebook, for example, they have hundreds of thousands of shards of MySQL. Hundreds right. of thousands. Not a thousand, hundreds of thousands. And Facebook has spent engineering millennia knitting those together into a big meta, meta database. Very custom, super snowflake technology, only good for Facebook. But, you know, what Cockroach is building probably wouldn't ever be able to apply to Facebook because their scale is so enormous and they have... They, they have a careful balance of consistency and eventual consistency. It's a very complex system. But uh, what's interesting is Google's experience with AdWords and MySQL and sharding led them to create a moratorium on that kind of an architecture. They said, no, we're not going to do this again. Right? Once is enough. Right? So if you want to build a large scale system, you've got to use something else. And uh, around 2004 is when Bigtable came out. And Bigtable is really geared towards that problem I was talking about of associating data with cookies and search. They're just massive scale. And Bigtable wasn't like, you know, we don't like SQL. We don't want to use SQL. Uh, it was really, well, SQL is really complicated, and we've got a bigger problem right now, which is scale. And that's big enough, and not just scale, but elastic scale. And so Bigtable was a direct consequences of the challenges and the opportunities that Google was facing. Like, how do you, how do you, they, they didn't buy mainframes or, you know, Sun Microsystem, you know, huge multiprocessor systems. They, they were doing commodity hardware. They're kind of like the proto cloud, right? It was Google's cloud, and it felt like a public cloud internally, right? So Google was like 10 years ahead of the, the rest right. of the ecosystem back then. Uh, and, and so how can you knit a big database together out of all of these commodity servers? 
And that's what Big Table was, and it was groundbreaking. And that paper was, you know, definitely one of the most read papers at, at the time, and um, spawned the entire NoSQL movement. Yes, I was going to say that they started that that movement as well, right? Yeah. So go yeah. on. Sorry. Yeah, they started a lot of them, um, and it was internally it was very exciting too. It was an amazing piece of technology, and you know everyone was pretty jazzed about it. And I remember there was an ask early on of like from I think the infrastructure team, okay, AdWords, you know you guys are having trouble with your MySQL sharding. You just use Bigtable. This will handle your scale issues. And um, there was a huge pushback because they said, okay, guys, we have like, I don't know what it was at the time, probably like a couple hundred tables. We need transactions. We're talking about people's financial uh, information. There's essentially a ledger happening. Like this is not, there's a huge impedance mismatch between yes. us coming from a relational database system, even if we have a, a very awkward sharding mechanism uh, to going to Bigtable, which is just not set up. And it's like uh, Bigtable is great for certain kinds of tasks, but uh, AdWords required something that, you know, fundamentally SQL relational database has been evolving for 40 years by that time, 40 years, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't just replace it in one fell swoop. And so interestingly, Google responded to that, the infrastructure teams responded to that, and they created something called Megastore. And Megastore came out two years later. So this is very interesting because, uh, you know, uh, MongoDB didn't get transactions until like 2019 or something like that, right? Google had transactions, a limited form of them, to be fair, in 2006, because the big table kind of fell flat for certain use cases, right? We need That's to right. have some kinds of consistency. The big table, or Mon, uh, Megastore introduced that. And they also introduced the idea of consensus-based replication. So a big step forward in Megastore is two years after big table. But quickly after that, people realized, you know what? There are are more things we need to do. We want general purpose transactions, not these limited ones that Megastore brought. And we want to sort of, uh, in some ways, you can think of spanners as sort of closing the circle. Like the circle got opened, right? It's like, we need to deal with massive scale. And then it's like, okay, it started to close. We need to get some kind of transactions. Now we need really general purpose transactions. And then eventually they created something called F1, which is we actually want to bring SQL back because we want to replace AdWords. We want to replace the MySQL sharded mess uh, with a the new next generation system. But in order to do that, we can't just make them rewrite everything for some weird new API. It actually should be SQL. Or it should look enough like SQL that we can make that transition. So they came full circle. It's very interesting. And so, you know, when we left Google, we realized, well, you know, we want a relational database too, uh, and um, uh, we also want these capabilities. And we know it needs to be open source. So we had the enviable opportunity to fast follow Google, yeah. which is a yeah. lot easier than uh, doing it all for the first time. Well, I think we're all benefiting from that period of time at Google, right? I mean, today, Spencer, you and I, we get in conversations with customers and it's like, they're almost like your conversation right now is some of the stuff that I'm hearing in some large organizations. Well, we've scaled this database and it's falling over and we're having problems with it. And we can only go so far. And then they're trying to figure it out using legacy tech and knowing that, well, there is actually prior art. We, we, there is actually somebody who has solved this. And, and I, you know, to me, this, the, you know, Borg turning to Kubernetes, um, that, that whole movement, um, just the, the wherewithal and the, the vision at Google to actually understand what the future of, of compute was going to be, um, you know, resulting, what are we, 15, 17 years later or 12, you know, 20 years later after that journey, you know, really, really kind of took off, right? Um, yeah, it's, and it's, it's, it's a good 15 years at least, yeah, from like the major, yeah. I think, technological advances. And and it's uh, one, one thing that's really interesting is just that you mentioned Borg and Kubernetes. I mean, that, yeah. you know, for a while when Kubernetes was new and didn't really do stateful workloads, there was like a, a non-trivial contingent of people that would opine <laughs> frequently that, uh, well, Kubernetes is really just for stateless services. Stateful right. just isn't going to work. That's not what it's for. Well, you looked at Borg back in 2005 and six, and Believe me, Borg ran everything. It ran Bigtable, it ran Megastore, it ran Spanner, it ran Colossus, it ran D. Uh, it ran stateful services and it ran them with uh, ease. And, uh, and and that's, of course, what orchestration needs to do. It's not just the stateless stuff, right? It's it's everything. And so there's a there's a there's a really good uh, match between orchestration technologies like Kubernetes and database systems like Cockroach. The two are made for each other. So it's good to see Kubernetes evolving and maturing and being able to handle that that much wider um, you know uh, spectrum of use cases and infrastructure. Yeah, that's right. And it's 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 uh, Brandon Phillips a long time ago once quoted this out. It's like it's Giphy. It's Google Google infrastructure for everybody. I think is what he wanted to have. And that, and like, I think that's where we're headed. 
Um, but, you know, but one of the things that had come out of that whole conversation, I remember this like four years ago, was the whole concept of operators and actually simplifying the life of how all this stuff works. How much did it take to actually make all this work back then? I mean, just from a, just a pure resources point of view, Spencer, like if I'm going to have, okay, I'm going to go from four shards to a thousand shards at Google or at Facebook, we'd have teams and teams of people that have to manage this, right? Is that, I mean, how, how oh, yeah. many people were involved? I mean, it was just it, it massive. Yeah, it's amount. people times time, right? Like that's, yeah. that's why I always use like things like engineering years uh, and engineering yeah. centuries and engineering millennium. Right. And, yeah. and I think the reality is that like, uh, Google, I don't know about Google AdWords and that charted my SQL system. You know, if it if you could linearly extrapolate how much time we spent on it, I mean, oh, sure yeah. it was engineering centuries. Uh, you know, I'm sure of it. I, I don't know if the if the system matured to a point where they didn't have to do much work on it at some point in that interim. I, I really I didn't follow it that closely, but I, right. I am aware that uh, Facebook has spent engineering millennia on their database systems. Yeah, and that's that's not something to uh, take very lightly, right? That's a yeah, that's an that's an eye opening um, stat. But if you think about it, obviously Oracle had engineering millennia put into it, and so did DB2 and um, you know, yeah. it's like databases take seven years to mature and Stonebreaker's famous sort of rule of thumb. And um, and then they have a lifetime which can go decades beyond that. And uh, that's right. They're, they're, there's such a vast surface area to relational databases uh, that follow the sort of modern SQL standards. It's uh, it's a uh, kind of a an unfillable pit, right? You just kind yeah, of, you're pouring exactly. into it and it just keeps going. Uh, and, you know, the thing gets better and better, but you just look down and you're like, wow, we, we can't even see the cement. We keep pouring it in. <laughs> so, yeah. it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a huge task, but uh, it's it's absurdly valuable, right? Every yeah. service and application in the world is backed by some kind of a database. And uh, many of them are backed by relational databases. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, we have a customer that's uh, you know, one of the, the big big financial services companies and just in one of their arms they have 6500 just like one of their business units 6500 externally facing applications and that's just like nice. mind blowing yeah yeah I and mean, the amount of databases that you hit in your day thus far between waking up till this moment and it's only a couple hours it's just insanity right like i joke about that in the legacy databases all the time um but you you know, I love the concept of engineering millennium and it's like, well, there's DevOps millennium and there's a SRE millennium as well. That's putting me these systems. And I don't think people really understand like what it actually takes to get them going. I, I, one of the reasons I love that I'm on here with, with what the OpenShift team is doing at Red Hat and simplifying the operations side and that side of the world. I just, um, but, but we talked a little bit about how, you know, CockroachDB is aligned very well with Kubernetes, Spencer, um, and just being a distributed database on top of a, you know, distributed orchestration platform, right? Like that. Um, it, it is absolutely what originally attracted me to this company. Um, if you look at the future of the database, to me, I believe that it's got to be distributed SQL. But when you combine that with, you know, you know, I think it what is is it is it Stonebreaker that says it takes seven years for a database to fully gestate and mature, right? Yeah. So like, building a database takes seven years, right? Building a distributed system adds a wholly other layer on top of that, right? Like it is like that's that's complexity on complexity, you know. I guess going back to the, the beginning of, of what we've done at, at Cockroach and architecting from the ground up, what were the biggest challenges to actually get this to work, right? Like, I mean, I think we had a really good sample in, in the Spanner white paper, but, you know, technically there were some pretty, pretty hefty challenges that, that we faced early and we still face today, right? I mean, we've been building for five and a half, almost six years now. So what were some of the biggest challenges at the very beginning? Well, the distributed transaction model is, uh, is, is you know, required a, a lot of work. Also, the consensus replication. I mean, people, yeah. it's not unusual for undergraduates to implement RAFT, which is a variant of access. It's what we use. Uh, you know, it, one of my co-founders, Ben Darnell, likes to quip that it took him a week to implement RAFT in, uh, you know, probably another several years to make it actually work in production properly. <laughs> so that's uh, just, it, it's, uh, it's kind of shocking to hear that, but it's, um, it's, it's incredible where, just how much of the devil's in the details in, yeah. in building these things. And the transaction model is another just fascinating thing that we worked on because Cockroach isn't just distributed in terms of, hey, you can shovel in more commodity hardware within a data center. Cockroach is meant to be distributed across data centers, for example, within a region, like different availability zones on the US East Coast. That would be 
you know, how you really, really want to do the geo replication. So you have low latency, but consensus replication, but it's also built to be replicated across continents, like vast geographic distances. So how do you build a transaction model that gives you serializable isolation and minimizes all of the round tripping? And that's, uh, you know, SQL is a very chatty protocol. Uh, you, you, you open up a transaction, you read stuff, and then you write stuff. Uh, you know, all of the, every time you do a read, you're actually hitting the database. Uh, that certainly, you never ever want that chattiness to go, for example, from Australia over to Virginia. That would, that would absolutely destroy your, your transaction time. So how do you actually build, how do you plan for that? What does the topology look like of the cluster? And how does the transaction model work? And we have, uh, you know, anyone that's really interested in the deep details of this, there's a lot of interesting posts on our blog that describe uh, sort of the state of the art in terms of how we're managing that. But you know those two things, transactions and replication, uh, by far are the stickiest points, and they continue to be. Honestly, they, we, there's there's a lot of stuff on the drawing board for how we're going to really make global transactions uh, something that everybody can use. Uh, Trivial. That's, right. That's right, and I think it's. Um, I, I always uh, I always point people to our docs as well, Spencer, because I think there's just like if you really want to get into it, what Jesse and team does on that side is just it's tremendous, right? Like it's there's such really really good stuff there, so. But coming back to distributed transactions, and you also mentioned serializable, um, you know, and I think that's a that's a that's a big task to take on, right? Because you know our ultimate competition here is the speed of light, right? Like, I mean, if we're really going to do this at global scale, right? Like, I always think about that as like, you know, one of our engineering leads always sits up, you know, here's speed of light. That's our that's our end goal. That's what we're trying to get after, right? Um, that's a tough the way, one to get. I really like that, Jim. I really like that. Like the next time someone, uh, some investor asked me, like, you know, who, tell me about your competitors, and I said, well, you know, our real only real competitors, the speed of light. <laughs> well, it really is they ultimately. I mean, like, <laughs> well, I, I I use it all the time because I mean, look at it, building a distributed transaction model from the ground up is not simple. I think there's a couple companies that are trying to do this as well. It, it's not a simple task. It took you know how long at Google. I I go through the beginning of everything at Google and how long it took to get to Spanner Spencer because. It is engineering millennia. It is a lot of expertise because it, these are not simple things to do. Um, you know, building Oracle from the ground up from way back. I mean, what an incredible database. I mean, what a. I mean, it, it is incredible technology. I still think like that and Photoshop. I think are two of the most incredibly complex. Yeah, I mean, I, pieces, I, you know, I, I always describe Oracle as like the absolute evolutionary peak of the monolithic architecture for database. It's amazing. I mean, it is a fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it's system, no question. I mean, it's running most of the world's uh, high value use cases, or at least the plurality of them. It's it's definitely an extraordinarily successful company as well. Um, there's, yeah. there's there's some things that, uh, you know, uh, people don't love about uh, their, their vendor relationship with Oracle, but you can't argue with their success. It's a great product. Yeah, I mean, our, our, our society is, you know, <laughs> a lot of the advances that we have are due to that because this this, this transactional model and being able to actually implement serializable, like our banking, every, like our money is basically run through systems like that. And so doing serializable isolation in a, in a distributed transaction model presents some fairly difficult like complications, right, Spencer? I mean, like there's a couple of things that we did, I think that are interesting here, A, like the way that we implemented it, but also geo partitioning is also kind of part of that whole conversation as well. Can you just kind of describe just a little bit about, I mean, I guess, you know, we're only a half hour and a little, like a little deeper into kind of how that works with raft and everything and like how the geo partitioning works, I guess, I don't know, at the 5,000 foot level. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a shot. I mean, there's, there's a lot of technical detail and even oh, yeah. at the high level, there's a lot of pieces that are moving, um, but, but, but it's, it's really but Spencer, constructive. Spencer, this is, this is how you become a marketer, see, because like engineers <laughs> will laugh at you like, what was that? You just glossed over like 80 things. <laughs> But it's, it's, you know, I'll, yeah. I'll try to I'll try to put on my marketing hat more than my engineering hat. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one thing that's just really important there's a there's a, a, a dichotomy in the database that uh, I think people sometimes conflate the two things. But there's geo replication and then there's uh, or just replication and generally not it doesn't have to be geographic. But uh, and then on top of that is the transaction model. So when you write a single key uh, or even a group of keys that are kind of close together, um, they they can all be written atomically as part of the wrap or Paxos, doesn't matter, um, replication protocol. The, the problem is that when you have a truly distributed system that's quite large, you've got lots of different, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, shards. We call them ranges, but they're essentially chunks of the key space that are replicated between, say, any three nodes you have. But you might have 100 nodes, and so you've got 
lots of different uh, replicated um, shards or of the key space. And so in, in order to actually write to multiple parts of that key space that live on different nodes in the, in the larger distributed system, that's where a distributed transaction comes in. So at the low level, you've got replication through something like Paxos or RAP. And at the top level, that's where you have a distributed transaction protocol. And those two things have to work very well together. Um, you know, so you mentioned serializable, as probably most of the people on, that are listening to this are aware from their experience with databases. In the SQL ANSI standard, there's a, there's a number of different isolation levels. And these isolation levels are really difficult to understand because they're not based on something that developers are thinking about. What they're really based on is what database developers have been able to create in terms of trade-offs between how quickly uh, or how much uh, if, how much latency there might be in a transaction yeah. versus uh, you know how much isolation that you're getting. And so you can have less isolation and uh, you know really let the database blaze through. In other words, transactions that might be overlapping or intersecting in some way, they don't really care about each other. Some people call that like the the uh, I probably shouldn't use the word, but you know it starts with an F. But uh, you know, effort mode transactions. Let's say uh, you know that's that's like the uh, read uncommitted, <laughs> uh, and then it goes yeah. you know, through these different levels, uh, all the way up to serializable. And when people talk about acid transactions, <laughs> that I isolation, that means serializable. Let's just be honest, right? Like all those other modes, they're about trading off isolation in order to get more efficiency in the database. So uh, you know, what we decided to do, like one of our our, our sort of overall mission for Cockroach Labs is to make data easy. It came from Square before, and there's this make commerce easy. We kind of got a little lazy there, but it's it's actually a great mission because you're only ever going to asymptotically approach it. Data is not easy, right? It's very, very much not easy. So by having that mission, we always know what our, our North Star is. Can we make the database simpler for people? And I, I talked about how to make it so that people can truly do global transactions easily. That's that's kind of one of our North Stars. But you know, in the early days of Cockroach, it was like, how can we make it so that when you're using distributed transactions, you're not trying to understand the distributed transaction model so you don't screw things up, but you still make it efficient. Instead, what we said is there's going to be one mode of isolation in Cockroach, serializable. And we started with two, actually. We had snapshot isolation as well. We ended up with just one serializable. We want that because that's the actual I in acid transactions. Right? That's right. the uncompromised, correct I. And so we said serializable only, but we need to make that fast. Right? So fast that you don't miss the other modes. And that's a work in progress still. But uh, we, we made a, a huge amount of progress in the first three years that really allowed us to only release with serializable and to make our customers happy with that. And that's great because as a developer, trying to understand what it means if you do repeatable read versus read committed versus snapshot versus serializable is a very difficult prospect. And in fact, people never get it right. And there was a paper about this that came out of Stanford. It's called uh, Acid Rain. And it analyzes available open source e-commerce applications, which actually happen to run more than 50% of the e-commerce on the web. And they analyzed it with this very intelligent tracing mechanism to see whether there are what are called anomalies uh, due to weaker isolation levels in the transactions that the e-commerce systems were doing. I mean, some of these e-commerce systems weren't even doing oh, yeah. transactions some of the time. So it's like, there's some pretty shoddy programming out there. But even when they were trying to do the right things, they often didn't. And this thing would highlight those in ways that you could take these e-commerce systems. And for example, you could put multiple things in your checkout cart just by like right. um, sending a concurrent request because those concurrent requests would come in and the database wouldn't have the right isolation level and would let you do things that should be illegal if you had the right isolation level. And that allowed people to check out multiple items and pay once or to use coupon code codes multiple times. And so the reality is that this is just like a small sampling of e-commerce things that happen to be very heavily used. Um, but as I mentioned before, like there's there's probably hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of database backed applications out there where people just use the default isolation level, which is usually read committed. Right. And uh, are, are basically uh, these these applications out there are just uh, filled with holes. I mean, they're leaky buckets. So, any, you know, in, in, you know, just to give you a practical example of the risks here, there was a Bitcoin exchange. I, I don't want to say the wrong ones. I, I can't exactly call what it was, but it's in the paper. Uh, that was completely emptied out, and it was a it was a concurrency based uh, acid rain type attack. And so this is a this is actually a huge risk, and there's really money in it. So, uh, you know, this is uh, something that we wanted to remove that difficulty uh, of cognition from the developer. It's like, no, I use Cockroach. Right. 
I always get exactly the right isolation level. I don't have to play games with it trying to make my thing faster. So that's a, that, that, that's a, that's kind of a, it, I think it's a, a state of mind that we enter like the product uh, sort of ideation and uh, you know, what are we gonna set our standards? How are we gonna set them? And it's, it's just very helpfully aided by what our true north is, which is really to make data easy. That's right. And, and don't make compromises because of, we want to actually have the serializable isolation, right? We, we want the data to always be correct. Cause honestly, Spencer, I, I don't know too many developers who actually think about isolation levels in their database. They basically just spin up a database and turn it on and they don't even think about that configuration. I, I, you know. Yeah, they want, they want it to work. They expect it's gonna work. I mean, right. databases work really well, right? The problem is that people have set these isolation levels is they don't want people to do a load test and you know, if they defaulted to serializable, which would be the safe thing to do and let people opt out of that, uh, then you know, what would happen is people would be like, this database sucks. It's really slow. Right, right? exactly. Uh, and so it's, it's really just, uh, I know it's just a little cynical, but in the end, what you end up with is a lot of people that don't understand isolation levels, use the default isolation level and are leaving uh, a big gap in the security of their system. And that's, yeah. a, that's I think, a fundamental problem and is something, you know, we wanted to uh, let users, uh, you know, off the hook for that uh, extra knowledge. And, you know, we do want, we want developers to do what they do, which is like, hey, I've got to solve this problem. I want to build this application. I expect the database to work and it should work well. That's right. But that is exactly what they should think. They shouldn't have to understand isolation levels, but other databases either force you to understand them if you're going to be a very responsible programmer or they let you do the wrong thing. That, that's that's what right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, you know, my, one of the reasons I'm proud to work here is we've actually dialed the, the knob all the way up on the speed of light and serializable isolation, Spencer. And it's, it's forcing some really incredible software engineering out of the team because when you have those two things pegged, you're, you're actually forced to do some really interesting takes on, 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 on how to solve these problems. You know, like parallel commits, which we came out with last year, which allows us to basically kind of forward commit transactions to these there's there's stuff on our website about this that I think people can check out, but I think yeah, it, it also, just, it's worth mentioning, Jim, that there's a we we, we just had a paper in Sigmog, which actually that's is, right. is a is it's a wonderful wonderfully concise description in ten pages of a lot that's of what right. we're talking about. So people that are interested can read that, and if you really want the gory details, the blog posts from the engineers that worked on these things are uh, are, are really explanatory. That's right, and and. If not anything, just to explore kind of the inner workings of Cockroach Database, which I think is really interesting. Um, but as people go and build distributed systems, there is some really good examples of how you actually think about these things from a software engineering point of view as well. I think that's one of the reasons that, you know, being part of an open source company, contributing back to a community, is we do share all these ideas. And I think it's, it's some really kind of novel ways of thinking through these things is, is I, it's that's what this banner paper did for us, right? Like it's only right that we, also publish these sort of things back. So, um, but, but coming back to that, and so, you know, we, people can use NoSQL to get scale across the planet, right? But they can't get serializable isolation, right? And that's one of those, that's one of the, like at AdWords, right? Way back in the day, Spencer, that's why they couldn't use Bigtable, right? And so, you know, how are, how are organizations using CockroachDB today? Um, you know, we have what? A couple hundred customers, we have some really huge, massive implementations of this, right? Some, some great brand names. Um, some really kind of, you know, high, high powered use cases, you know, when, when people ask you, how are people using us today? What, what do you typically respond with? Well, I think there's, you know, the, 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 the easiest answer is the cockroach is a system of record. Right? So it's right. a cloud native relational database and it's for any application that, you know, needs a system of record, which is most of them. Um, and it's particularly. I think a, a, a an appropriate choice for workloads that are very high value. And I mean, there, there are certain workloads where you can you can absolutely use something like Cassandra, and it's not necessarily a bad choice. Or MongoDB. I mean, these are these are good systems in their own right. Uh, but you know, relational database, high value use cases, the right kind of consistency. That's what Cockroach is really geared towards. But there's three primary capabilities or differentiators that Cockroach is bringing, and you know, some of our customers need all three. Uh, many of them need just two out of the three. And it's kind of somewhat rare that you just need one, although that does happen. Uh, and, and all three of these differentiators are fundamentally born from the distributed nature of its architecture. And that's why it's distributed, right? Like you, 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 you create a new architecture, not for the heck of it, but so that you get new capabilities. And those three are scale, resilience, and global, or multi-region at least, right? And I'll just kind of go through them. Scale is, is pretty simple to understand, right? A relational database that's monolithic, you can scale it up. 
but it's a super linear cost curve with a ceiling that's actually not very high when you look at sort of global workloads. And so, you know, as an example, you know, if, if you were a food delivery service in COVID and we, we have a customer that moved, uh, you know, they were using Amazon Aurora and, you know, Amazon Aurora can scale reads out, you know, relatively well, but it can't scale writes. And so you get like the XXL size and, um, you know, if you kind of start hitting the, the limits there, your database starts to cavitate and then falls over. And so they, they became, uh, it was, you know, code red and, and they had to get off Amazon Aurora and they tried cockroach and cockroach can scale the rights out arbitrarily. Right. So doing that, getting that elastic scale, which is a no SQL thing that no SQL brought to the, the world, to the market, uh, but doing it in the context of a relational database, that's special. Right? We're not the only ones that do it right now. Obviously spanner can do it. There's, there's some other, uh, sort of smaller competitors. Uh, you know, but it's, it's, it's significant and it really matters. Like, especially like, I think we're entering the era of what I call transactional big data, right? If you think about, uh, you know, the, the history of, of, of what databases have supported is sort of, you know, back in the nineties, it was enterprise scale. So like within a company, what are the kinds of customers that an average company used to have? But then the web kind of hit this web scale idea. Uh, and that was kind of, okay, you know, in, in a web scale, you can get a hundred million customers that are banging on this every day. You can get a billion, right? Uh, you can even go beyond that. But there's only so many humans that are interacting with computers and interacting with the databases that are backing services and applications. I think the next uh, era that we're already entering is really when you have non-human entities with some agency that are connecting to services. Uh, as an example, IoT, right? Or, or virtual agents that aren't even like, like physical pieces of hardware, but it's just virtual things that are checking um, you know, the prices on something, um, but they're doing it at machine speeds. And right? now you're talking about not like sort of order 10 billion human beings banging on keyboards and mouses and things like that and interacting. You're talking about, uh, you know, 100 billion, maybe a trillion. Like you're talking about orders of magnitude that, that are, are, are going to increase. And so scale is going to become a, a, a much bigger problem even than it is today. And, and it's already becoming one for many companies. Resilience, you know, we kind of mentioned this about geo replication. Fundamentally, you want to be able to think of a data center going away, not as a disaster recovery scenario, but as IT resilience. Like a data center going away should be, okay, we had three seconds of additional latency, no data loss, no postmortems for our application team. Everything's coming along. We'll get that data center back up. Uh, things will re replicate and then we'll be back in sort of the nominal green. If you look at Google and their high value use cases, they'll put it across five data centers even across like the, the different uh, right. uh, power grids in the United States, because they want to be able to say, okay, we've got five things. Everything's nominal. Everything's up and running. Lots of redundancy here. Things are working fine. Okay. We need to take a data center out for planned maintenance. They're going to replace something or that's just not going to be available. And we, we know about it. We're planning ahead. We take that out. Now we're down to four with consensus based replication. As long as you have a majority. So if you have five, three out of five, if you've got three data centers for replication, then it's two out of those three. As long as you have the majority, then you're never going to lose data. You're going to have forward operation in your system. So if you've got five, you have this amazing property where you can take one out for a plan maintenance and then, you know, all hell light breaks loose somewhere else and you lose another one. Now you've only got three of your replication sites. You still have complete business continuity. And so that's, a, it's a new way of thinking. It introduces latency. So it does come at a cost. You can manage that. You can put the three replication sites very close to each other, say like uh, in on the East coast of the United States, or you can spread them across. If you spread them across, you get better sort of non-correlated failure domains, uh, but you have more latency, but you, you pay That's a right. price. And, and when I was talking about our transaction model, we're, we're getting it down so that we have absolutely minimal latency on these even geographically distributed uh, transactions. So you can do a huge yeah. distributed transaction, modifying hundreds of different tables, and we can get that all down to one consensus latency. Just one, not even a, not even a, a two step, which is normal for a distributed transaction. So you're able to hide that second phase of the transaction from the end user. And you mentioned parallel right. payments, that's what that is. Um, yeah. And then the third thing I mentioned global or at least multi-region. Uh, this is the most exciting one. This is like 2020s. This is gonna be on everyone's roadmap. But the question is how do you build a global data architecture? And what I mean by that is you have, even as a startup, the opportunity to have customers in Australia, customers in Brazil, how do you give those customers a first-class user experience? I'll tell you what you don't do. You don't put your entire application in one availability zone. Right? Right. You can't have Australian users hitting Virginia every time they want to you know, do something on their app. It's going to be like a half-second lag at the minimum. Right? When they hit a button, a half-second, you can notice that very easily. In fact, 
Department of Defense figured out it was 100 milliseconds or less for command and control systems. That's the, the, the threshold for instant, instantaneity. So if you can get less than 100 milliseconds, you can make, make it feel completely real time and interactive. And obviously this matters for AR and VR and interactive media and gaming and self-driving. But I think it also matters for any kind of application going forward. When you start to have an experience with your mobile app where you hit a button and instantaneously you're seeing interactions with other users, like you can design new things that we haven't seen yet. Right? It's going to push the state of the art forward and companies that are kind of doing things the old fashioned way, their users in Brazil, their users in Australia, their users in Japan, those users are going to feel like this is a kind of an antique app. It's kind of like when the iPhone got bigger and you had those like black bars on the side because the app maker hadn't updated their application. And you're like, well, this app maker is kind of cheesy. Like everyone else has kind of gotten with the program. These guys, obviously, they must not have enough engineers because <laughs> like they're not using my full screen and it's a, it's not as good an experience as it could be. That same thing is going to happen. And part of that's driven by 5G. You mentioned that earlier. But the other big part of it is not just latency. It's about data sovereignty. Right? You've got things like GDPR. You even have states like California and New York threatening to create data privacy regulations that are different from other states. We could have balkanization of data privacy laws in the United States. Um, but you know, Vietnam requires you to keep a copy of the data there. South Korea's got its laws. Brazil's got very uh, stringent laws. China and Russia, they require that all your data is domiciled there. Uh, obviously, if, if you're Facebook, you can fight those, but smaller companies can just get drummed out of business pretty quickly. So there's a, there's a lot of liability right now in the world in terms of, hey, I've got a business and I'd like to embrace a global user base, but can I do that responsibly? Can I do that in a way that you know, meets any kind of legal requirements that I have, but also what's the user preference? Let's say you're a SaaS business, right? And you would like to have customers uh, in Asia you can bet that their preference is going to be that, like, if you're storing their employment records or their sales data or something, you can bet that they want that stored in their legal jurisdiction. And if you're going to compete with a local, a more local operator that's Asia-based, uh, that is going to, to give them that guarantee, you're not going to have a very good story to tell, right? So, like, how do you build those holistically global data architectures? And Facebook can build them. Uber builds them. Netflix builds them. Google builds them, right? But uh, can a startup? Obviously not, right? We put it in one availability zone because that's somewhat, you know, tractable. And, and and what's interesting is can can the companies in the global 2000, can a random financial right. services company that might have more than a billion dollars in revenue, can they build a global data architecture? And the answer is they can't. They can't. Right? Because that, that's not their expertise. They don't hire those kinds of people that are kind of on that cutting edge. So what we fundamentally think of ourselves as doing is, okay, it's very complex building a truly global application or service, but the database is the hardest part of that, no question. We want to make that right. easy, right? We want to make that at least if it's not doesn't start easy, it's tractable, and then we make it easy as we go. So those right. those three things: scale, resilience, and global. The big yeah, and, and and that's exactly right, Spencer. And I think what we're looking at is the beginning of a massive, huge transformation in a way that all of us think about applications, right? I mean, it's like a, you know, it, you and I joke about 5G. It's like you remember when we went from dial-up to DSL and how fast the internet was at home, it's that same type of aha I think is gonna happen with people, but it's gonna be on their phone and it's gonna be everywhere. And how do you actually meet the needs of your consumers from that SLA, right? They're, what do they expect out of you? I think the 100 right. millisecond rule is, is hugely important for, for organizations as they think about applications at that scale. But this resilient thing too, and I think, you know, I think this is why a lot of people are moving towards Kubernetes and doing this whole thing. It's like this whole concept of having this you know this 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 orchestration platform that's doing that for you, but then surrounding it with the with the enterprise capabilities that they need to basically manage and monitor these things. And I think that's where you know our our hosts Red Hat OpenShift are doing such a great job, you know, pushing down that path. How do we make it easy to install things? How do we make it easy to manage things? How do you you know how do you how do you sort out a rolling upgrade of software? Right, you could do that now, right? Like in production, it's cool. Um, and I think yeah. you know operators and, and this this whole marketplace and everything and what's going on is it's 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 awesome, right? So it's incredibly that's exciting that's because what what all of this stuff represents from the public cloud to all of the uh, you know new orchestration technologies, Kubernetes, OpenShift, uh, these things are you know fundamentally allowing companies to not spend those engineering centuries or those DevOps centuries, right? Uh, yeah. That is that is that allows everyone to do more with less. But it, it, you know, it, ultimately, uh, what you what you find is is pretty interesting. Like the cloud's a lot cheaper, right? And and, and right. you know, taking infrastructure as a service, the total cost of ownership is actually less expensive. Um, but but ironically, people end up spending more. 
but it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's kind of a growth mindset, right? You can do more with less. And so you have uh, additional engineers, additional capability, which means you can build another service in that same amount of time, yeah. right? You can, you can yeah. further improve the experience for your customer. And I think, you know, that's, that's sort of the, the, the world that we're entering. It's extremely exciting. And, and fundamentally, it's, I think, once in a generation that you see this kind of a shift. And it's a paradigm shift and it's, 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 it's a big paradigm shift. It took me a while to figure out Kubernetes and how the whole thing worked because it was, I was used to the old world, you know, it was a different way. And I think there is prior, there's, you know, there's organizations, i.e. Google and others that have kind of done this sort of thing. Um, but there were a couple of questions that were in the chat, Spencer, that I want to actually come back to. Some of them have to do with this, like, you know, how do you shift? You know, there's things, there's concepts that we had in the enterprise world that makes sense now. One of them is kind of like backup and restore. How do you deal with backup restore in a in a in a distributed database? Sorry guys, I just jumped in the questions, Diane and Michael. I you know I was I was looking for the right way to do it. Yeah. Right? So, no, it's I just great. wanted to say that you know just let everyone know that we are streaming live all over the internet right now. So we got questions coming in from YouTube, Twitch, and other places. And uh, if you wanted to give a shout out to the whole world, Jim, please do. Hi world. From from beautiful Colorado <laughs> today, so <laughs> so Spencer, uh, one of the questions that came in was about backup and restore, and how do you think about that in distributed database? This is a different thing, right? Because you're dealing not just with like the backup and restore of the database, but like these, this data sovereignty thing comes into it too, right? Yeah, it's uh, it's 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 incredibly uh, you know textured actually. You know, it is one thing when you had sort of one bin log coming out of MySQL. Now we've right. got uh, potentially you know 250 nodes, and they might be in different countries, and so you've got this you know geo partition. Some data might be rep replicated only within Europe. Some data only replicated. You can control all that at the row level in a table in Cockroach. So, yeah, that that vastly complexifies the uh, the burden on the backup and restore. And you know what what we actually end up doing, what we found to work best, is to uh, you know, make the backup restore policies definable on the same level as we actually do uh, the sort of domiciling policy. So where the data is stored, you also need the backup and restore to work that way. We didn't start that way, but it's moved in that direction because exactly as you say, Jim, you know, uh, if you if you have data that's only supposed to live in Europe, you definitely want to back it up only in Europe too. You don't want that to stream over to the U.S. for lots of reasons. Uh, and so, you know, but one 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 I think really important point to bring up here is that we don't have to solve all these problems on our own. Uh, you, you realize that in this new right. ecosystem, all of your customers, not all of them, but most of them have access to all the other cloud infrastructure that's out there. So really what you, re you want to be able to allow them to do as an example, and this is just one of many things you could do, but uh, you can have for the European data that could be backed up to an S3 bucket that is sitting in Europe. Specifically, right. right, and so you, you, you kind of you're actually using Am what AWS is providing, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, geographically uh, spread out around the world in order to augment um, cockroaches' capabilities and to complement them. And that's I think that's critical because if you try to solve this all, uh, you know, in the database, the the um, the amount of work and the complexity, it, it's it's counterproductive, right? And, and it's, yeah. it's ultimately not what customers want, right? That you kind of want to use a best of breed approach. So we, we do try to integrate with everything in the in the ecosystem. Yeah, and, and to be multi-cloud and run everywhere and take advantage of whatever it is on each of the public cloud providers, I think is a, is a big piece. So um, Dan, Mike, um, was there any other question that you guys wanted to throw in here? You guys have, have uh, really addressed almost all of the questions. I know. See, I try to do it. I try to do it as it goes along, Mike. You know me, right? Like I'm no, trying. I to, I, I've been capturing them on YouTube and pulling down from Twitch, and it looks like you've been addressing them without specifically saying, "Okay, here's, uh, you know, Paris Lucas's question." So, if there are any other questions, either here on the Blue Jeans session or from YouTube or Twitch or any others, please do post them. We have our video producer team grab them and pull them into the chat here. So we'll get them addressed for you. There was one I just here. see a question about lifecycle support. Is a, yeah. Is an interesting one. Yeah, that's a good um, one. Yeah. So I mean, you want to repeat it, Spencer? So the question is um, software life, life cycle support. How does the software, how, how, how do you do a software upgrade without downtime? So, uh, you know, that, that's a good question. It's actually not just the, the software upgrade. It's uh, also things like backup and restore. You don't want to lock tables, uh, schema changes. So we do online schema changes. It's very, you know, cockroaches, uh, you know, very predicated on any kind of thing that, that you do to, to manage the database, whether it's an upgrade or a backup or, uh, you know, change to the underlying data model. 
all of those are uh, do not require downtime, uh, and including scaling the database up, scaling the database down, uh, moving from one cloud to another. All these things can be done live. Uh, the software upgrade, I, I won't go into too much detail, but basically what, what you're allowed to do is have uh, multiple nodes in successive versions. So you can have a mix of versions and like uh, certain kinds of features don't mind that there's a different version because they're, they're not really predicated on the version. Um, but sometimes you have a new feature where it's not going to ever work if there's a mixed version situation. So what will happen is when you, you have that mixed thing, you can't use that new feature yet. It's available on the nodes that, uh, that are the newer version, but even on those nodes, you're not actually able to access that feature. Uh, and then what happens is you kind of, you, you, you get to all of the nodes being the newest version. And then at that point, you, you'd make sure that the system works. You can run it that way for a while. If it doesn't work, you can, you can downgrade it back to the previous version. Uh, and, and again, it's really just about restarting each node uh, sort of in a rolling restart fashion. Um, but if things are working nicely and you don't need to downgrade, uh, then you kind of flip a switch. You say, okay, now we're going to make the minimum version for this cluster, the new version. And that enables the new functionality. So that, that's just a, a little bit. There's more details than that to it. But and so when you do that, though, I mean, there's there's some concerns within the application itself of how you build that to be backwardsly compatible to features, right? And so I think one of the benefits of, of, of Red Hat OpenShift and Kubernetes is that you can do these rolling upgrades across compute, right? And like, think about CockroachDB as just a simple application running in a pod in Kubernetes, you all. Like, that's how we get deployed on Kubernetes. I mean, we actually fit this environment very, very well. Um, but I think, you know, just for people who are casually listening to this, there is things you have to think about inside the application itself to actually make that work and work very well. Um, the orchestration platform will surely do this, this beautiful rolling upgrade for you, which is like, what a huge, massive, awesome kind of capability. So um, there was another question in here, Spencer. It's a little bit in the weeds. Um, I don't know. Is there one that you're looking at in particular? I was going to do the atomic clock. I was looking at the uh, benchmark Kubernetes storage solution. Yeah, I like that one. Yeah. So this is from Waleed Shari. It says, uh, uh, have, they, have we benchmarked Kubernetes storage solutions? What kind of storage would we prefer to run on top of? Uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure that that some of our customers have benchmarked Kubernetes storage solutions. I don't know the actual details there, um, unfortunately, so I can't answer that part of the question. But uh, you know, the, the storage we prefer to run on top of are, are the ones that we have the most experience with. And right now, that's uh, GCP's uh, persistent SSD and AWS uh, EBS. And I think we've tried a lot of the different EBS ones, um, and, and we you know we've had different experiences with each. It's usually like a cost versus performance trade-off. Uh, those those persistent SSDs and the EBS, the really be beautiful thing about those storage solutions versus using raw SSD is that if you if you actually experience some sort of downtime um, from one of your nodes, let's say uh, you, you just lose a node, you know that that would be attached normally to raw SSD, that usually would require cross data center bandwidth in order to re replicate that missing S raw SSD device. When you use something like persistent SSD and GCP. You actually uh, rely on GCP to do that within that data center, so it saves you any kind of cross data center bandwidth. So it's very nice. That's how we run Cockroach Cloud, which is our hosted service. Uh, when come when we have customers that self-host, uh, so if they're running it in AWS or GCP, they can do the same thing we're doing with Cockroach Cloud. If they're running in a private data center, uh, I actually think the right thing to use is is probably some sort of Kubernetes storage solution that's doing something similar, right? That's actually doing a distributed file system that can handle intra-data center re-replication if a node is lost. So, um, you know, I, I just don't know exactly what the the best solutions are there. I know we've got a, a, a fairly large number of customers that are doing things in private data centers with a, yeah. with a variety of solutions from raw SSD to uh, distributed storage systems that can be run with Kubernetes. Yeah, and I've seen people using Ceph under Rook uh, from Kubernetes. Yeah, there's, an op there's a Rook operator for that. I mean, you know, for us, it's really simple. It can be as simple as a storage class mounting a volume, and then we use stateful sets to actually manage everything within the pod itself. So, Dan, I think we're I, I, have we run out of our time. Almost at the end of our <laughs> hour, and um, I, you seem to have covered off everything. You took a lot of the questions that I had out of it. I on the data sovereignty stuff. Um, I uh, a colleague of ours back in the day, uh, Dave McQuarrie, talked about data gravity, um, and mm -hmm the need for all of um, our, the GDPR, the data sovereignty issues, latency issues, all of those things. And I, and I think as we move forward, 
what you're doing and the evolution of distributed systems that you've been giving us a great tour de force and history on. Um, there's a lot of links um, to reference papers. I'm trying to find them as you mentioned them because they're just, just spurring my um, remembering of, of these points in time and when things changed. And and I, I'm curious maybe to end on where you think it will be in like 20, I don't know, I don't even want to say 2020. Five, four years from now, you know. I, I love that question, big, Diane. What the big leap, <laughs> next big leap is? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, listen. The the thing that is my guiding north star for where the ecosystem is going, and I want Carcoach to play very nicely in that ecosystem. Is you know, as a developer myself, and I, I would like to write an application next. And that's kind of my earlier point about iterating between infrastructure and applications. I want to be able to write something on my laptop, and then. When I'm done with it, like it's working when I test it, I want to say, okay, I'm going to push this to the cloud, but I'm not going to have to deal with VMs or, or any, any kind of uh, infrastructure myself. Whatever I've works on my laptop is not just going to work on the cloud. It's going to scale elastically. If I've got 100 million users, it's going to scale to 100 million users. If I've got users in Brazil all of a sudden, it's going to start storing their data in Brazil. Uh, and it's going to do that in a serverless fashion in terms of my 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 uh, uh, relation to the whole project as a developer. Right? And what that means is fundamentally, yes, I don't deal with VMs and you know the, the hands-on infrastructure and monitoring and all that stuff. None of that. But also, I only pay for what I use. Because you know, I've done a number of startups back when I had to do ex Exodus co-location and build my own servers and put them there, all the way till you know more recently where I, I get VMs in EC2 or in GCP. And, uh, you know, the, the I'm, I'm not very good at that stuff, but worse, what you end up doing when you launch your startups, you've got like 10 people poking at it, right? Because <laughs> you don't have product market fit yet. And you're paying for these VMs to just sit there. You've got a VM for your database, which is a big one, right? Because I mean, like, you're, you're, you're planning on success. So you start with all these things and you just, you're just paying out hundreds of dollars a month just immediately for, for, for you know, what, honestly, you don't, you don't have, you should be paying cents per month, right? And so that is, that's the goal. Like you, you should have consumption-based billing on everything and it should scale globally to any size and you should never lose your data. It should just always be up. You don't have to deal with any kind of monitoring. So that's the future. It's like a truly serverless future where you can take your idea, you can develop it, and then it just becomes a global reality. Like the way that Google builds things, right? Or the way that Uber has, a, has evolved their system so that when you go to Paris, your Uber account just works as it normally would, right? And it's like, uh, you know, that that is the kind of system that everyone should be building where you get that hundred millisecond rule essentially for free. So so that would be the Giphy for all. Yeah, Giphy for all, serverless Giphy for all, so, right? So serverless I, Giphy I, for all. You heard it here first. I think that's um like if you read lots of people's marketing messaging, that's already here. But the truth <laughs> and the reality is it's not and we still have to build it together. So um it's been wonderful right. getting to getting to hear your story, hear your point of view and how the evolution was distributed databases came about and where you're at right now. We really look forward to um, having the cockroach operator um, working on OpenShift, getting more use cases, more you know feedback to you guys, um, and um, want to hear more someday soon about Cockroach Cloud. Um, and, and I love cockroaches in a way that you wouldn't expect is they never die and they will be here till the end of time. So um, I think your naming in branding is brilliant. So um, you know, keep keep going. Whatever the next product is, I want to know what the name is you choose because you're you're dead on with the with your um, and your um, naming and branding as well as your technology. So thank you very much for joining us. Michael Waite um, has got a number of other um, operators coming up, um, uh, folks coming in the next couple of weeks in Stana and a few others. So um, look forward to more conversations around this and learning more about what people are doing and building that runs on OpenShift. So. Thanks for your time, Spencer, and your wonderful view, um, and uh, Jim for uh, your uh, your great uh, Q and A and question and keeping the conversation rolling. So thanks again, guys. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for having us. Really, really an honor. Thank you.